In this video, Matt Pohl talks about how Aboriginal artefacts were collected and studied. He explains some of the unethical practices that led to items coming into collections and how non-Indigenous collectors relied on Aboriginal people to find them. Matt also tells us about how universities have promoted anthropology and the impact that this has had on the way Aboriginal peoples and cultures are represented. He links this to the impact of evolutionary thinking and the concept of racial hierarchy that was prevalent in anthropology. Finally, he reminds us that because of government interventions and the history of Aboriginal dispossession, many items in museum collections have negative connotations for Aboriginal peoples. My name's Matt Pohl. I'm the Assistant Curator of Indigenous Heritage at the Maclay Museum and I'm also the University of Sydney's Repatriation Project Officer. The Maclay family came out here around 1823. Um, Alexander Maclay was the Colonial Secretary of New South Wales and over around 60 years, three generations of his family um, had a massive interest in natural history. Australia at the time being so fascinating to international natural historians, um, they amassed a pretty massive collection which was all housed at Elizabeth Bay House before it was bequeathed to the university and the museum as it is opened in 1891. From the Maclay bequest era, it's really interesting because a lot of Aboriginal knowledges were incorporated into the collection of natural history specimens. A lot of collectors were relying on Aboriginal guides and Aboriginal people to help them find different species of animals and different plants, different things like that. Um, a lot of Aboriginal people even uh, sold and traded items to collectors. And from around that same time period, a lot of those collectors started a side business where they were acquiring artefacts and trading them uh, to collectors in Australia and increasingly internationally as well. In that era, the ethics of collecting things were pretty all over the place. It was a bit of a free-for-all. <laughs> if you picked it up, you could have it. Sometimes uh, people were very engaged in wanting to trade things and developed very close relationships with collectors. And then in other times, there's certainly a lot of theft and taking of people's cultural heritage and using it and selling it without any benefit to the people it was being taken from. So it's a very broad spectrum of ways that the, these items came into museum collections, not just own, that's across all the First Nations cultures around the world. And so you do find some pretty unethical practices. Some of the problematic things that found our way into collections were picked up by people who witnessed massacres, for example, and then went and collected all the artefacts of deceased people, basically. And Luckily, through researching collections, we sometimes find diary notes of the people who actually did acquire these things unethically, and they're the type of items which today are a solid part of our the university's repatriation project. The role that the university played in constructing a representation of Aboriginal culture is pretty significant. The first ever anthropology department in Australia was founded at the University of Sydney in 1923. And for around 30 years or so, it was administered by one of the most famous anthropologists of Australian anthropology, um, A.P. Elkin. And he was a very interesting, problematic figure. He was also uh, deeply Christian, and he was also very paternalistic to the way that he um, administered the anthrop anthropology department. So after the Maclay bequest, the next big engagement as such with Aboriginal people comes through the University of Sydney Anthropology Department and a lot of the students who are some of the biggest figures in the history of anthropology in Australia were taught here and donated their collections and research materials to the universities at the end of their degree. Being based in Sydney yet collecting from right around the nation there's a broad spectrum um, which is really interesting. We have incredible collections from some of the most remote parts of the country at that time, yet we have very little from Sydney itself. So it sort of shows the focus of the time. Um, anthropology was very focused on what they thought was a pristine Aboriginal culture and didn't focus so much on the southeastern parts of the country, which they thought even at that time had been heavily impacted by colonisation. In so many cases, Aboriginal people wanted to make things for sale or trade. Um, and they would be paid for them very unethically, you know, traded for tobacco or different sort of things like that. Whereas some days when these things come back through the Sotheby's auction houses or places like that, they can be worth tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases. So the idea of collecting and trading and exchange isn't foreign to Aboriginal people at all. In some cases, they've probably been doing it for tens of thousands of years in very particular parts of the country. 
but the European model of collecting and economic exchange that was imposed over that history of Aboriginal trade routes pretty drastically changed the way that it had been um, happening for so long before then. In relation to the changes that happened in collecting, it's about excluding Aboriginal people from participating, especially in the economic aspects of trading and selling items of their culture. So there's a real historical disadvantage into how things were acquired and collected and then subsequently the life that they've had after they've been collected, which has been very controlled by non-Indigenous people. And it's one of the main issues for museums today is how do we give the moral authority back to Aboriginal people to control how items that were acquired in this historical period uh, represented and exhibited today. Why items were collected is really interesting, especially after Charles Darwin published The Origin of Species, evolutionary thought comes into a lot of it. And so people are collecting items from Aboriginal Australia to illustrate what they thought was um, you know, primitive or you know, even Stone Age people, to use those um, very offensive terms these days. They would use items that were collected to publish papers about the history of all mankind around the world at the time that they thought. And so Aboriginal culture, in a sense, was used as part of a racial hierarchy from what they considered uncivilised peoples to the top of the racial hierarchy, which was their civilised culture in Europe. A lot of the items that were acquired don't hold up in our modern sort of understanding of how important they are culturally, especially to modern community members. These practices of taking cultural materials then using them to illustrate non-Indigenous authored representations of Aboriginal culture still resonate for modern communities today. So many of the items that were taken broke connections between families. Um, this was also happening at a time of forced relocation of people onto missions and reserves. Um, it's in the period leading up to the stolen generation where sometimes the children of massacre victims were taken by people who were collecting items and different things like that. So there was a deliberate government intervention into the administration of Aboriginal people's lives in that period. And I think for a lot of modern community members, these objects represent that history of dispossession and the fact that they're technically owned by a museum is an issue that a lot of modern communities are grappling with and trying to understand and why we do so much community consultation in relation to holding or exhibiting or publishing images in this collection and why it's so important for the moral authority of Aboriginal people to be brought into the equation when we consider how, we, how museums use them or exhibit them putting the onus on communities to make the effort to engage with us. Some of the best stuff that we've done in relation to community consultation has been through piggybacking on other research projects that are happening and it's just a benefit, it's a win-win situation for both the museum and the community when we can use that information and share it and get information back. We don't want to be out there continuing the old practices of just collecting things and not giving something back to the community. So it's really important that it's a two-way street and when we use their information, they can use our information as well. They may use that in a native title case or they may use it in something else. So it's great that you know these dusty old things can be taken off the shelf sometimes and modern technologies can be applied to them and we can actually give something back which can economically empower Aboriginal communities. Wow.